Hello everyone, welcome to day six of our 30 day biology study challenge. If you've been with us the whole time, thanks so much for staying with us. If you are just tuning in for this one video or you're just starting the 30 day biology study challenge, welcome as well. Today we're gonna to be covering cell membranes and cell transport and do some active studying along with a content review. Let's get started. Remember all cells, no matter which type of cells, are gonna be surrounded by a cell membrane. They're also gonna have genetic information, DNA. They're also gonna have cytoplasm, that gel-like substance where all the components of the cell sit. But the membrane is really crucial for containing all the important materials of the cell. So as we mentioned in other videos, the cell membrane is a thin layer that surrounds all cells. It's made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So those phospholipids, are lipids and they have phosphate heads which are hydrophilic that will interact with water well and then tails two lipid tails which are hydrophobic that tend to avoid water they are water avoiding or water fearing according to the name the way the bilayer the phospholipid bilayer arranges itself and right here we're just looking at a cross section of a membrane remember this is all the way around the cell so if we we're like zooming in on one single section of our cell membrane this is what we're looking at but the outside of the cell will have the heads facing outward and then the inner components of the cell will also have those phosphate heads facing inward too. So the tails arrange themselves in the center of that double layer. These pink dots we will come back to right now, they're just representing different particles that could be outside or inside the cell. Now remember, all cells, whether eukaryotic or prokaryotic, will have a cell membrane that phospholipid bilayer. Some eukaryotic organisms and some prokaryotic organisms may also have a cell wall that is an extra layer of protection and support that surrounds the cell membrane. But all cells, no matter what they are, even if they do have a cell wall, do have a membrane as well. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into some of the other things that are happening within the cell membrane and what makes it so special. Now it's not just phospholipids, even though that's sometimes what are depicted, and it's not just transport proteins, which you might see in diagrams, and we'll get to those in a moment as well. There's also other integral proteins, peripheral proteins, carbohydrates, cholesterols, and each of these serve a different purpose within the cell membrane. We call it a fluid mosaic because there are lots of different pieces and components that's mosaic, and then fluid because it is fluid there is motion to it, it's flexible. And one of the most important molecules brain that is gonna help stabilize it, but also regulate the fluidity is the cholesterol molecule, which is a lipid as well. And we can see where it's found within that bilayer, again, towards the center, since lipids in general are hydrophobic. Another important molecule in the membrane you might hear about are carbohydrates, which primarily we will see on the extracellular side, so on the outside of the cell membrane. And they're used for various purposes, from protecting the cell to signaling to other molecules to serving as identification markers on the cell. A lot of times we'll find them attached to glycoproteins, and there'll be other proteins as well that can be found on the outward facing side of the cell membrane that are gonna help for signaling, they're gonna be help with identification of the cell or help the cell adhere or stick to other cells. There's a lot of different functions that these membrane proteins could have. Now, often when we talk about proteins within the cell membrane, we are talking about transport proteins, which are gonna allow certain molecules in and out of the cell. Now the cell membrane serves as a protective barrier it helps it communicate with the environment, but it also helps regulate what goes in and what comes out of the cell. And that's where sometimes these transport proteins get involved. So let's take a look at how molecules can get in and out of a cell, starting with passive transport or transport that doesn't require any additional energy. So first of all, there's simple diffusion, and these are really small molecules that are able to go from high concentrations to low concentrations without any extra energy added, and they don't need a special pathway or a door quote unquote, to get through the membrane. We'll see diffusion happen with nutrients and gas exchange, so the diffusion of oxygen into the blood. But if we're looking at a diagram, if we see molecules moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration and there's no protein, no ATP, then we can identify it as simple diffusion. Now there's also facilitated diffusion, which often occurs with larger molecules or molecules that aren't able to interact with the cell membrane because of their charge. And they will also go from a high concentration to a low concentration, high outside the cell, lower inside the cell, or vice versa. And no energy will be needed for this process, but they'll use these either carrier or channel proteins to get inside the cell. Again, both of these are passive transport. Finally, we get to active transport, which does involve ATP or energy. And this is when we are moving from a low concentration to a high concentration. So we're going against the concentration gradient and molecules are being sent in a way that requires extra energy. And we're gonna use an extra transport protein 
to have this happen. The good way to remember the difference between all of these is I like to think of the slide metaphor. So with simple diffusion, you're like a kid just going down the slide. You're going from a high point to a low point. So think high concentration to a low concentration. And when you go down the slide, think you're not using any energy. You're just falling down the slide. Physics people don't get mad at me. We're just gonna ignore kinetic and potential energy for right now. Then in facilitated diffusion, you're still going from high to low, going from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide, but you're getting a little help. So think of it as a child who's getting a push down the slide or having a parent that's helping them go down the slide with them. Then the active transport across the cell membrane is when a kid is climbing up the slide, like we were all told not to do when we were kids. We are going from low to high, so think low concentration to high concentration, and for that kid, it does require them to put out some energy. It's tough climbing up the slide. Anyway, it's a simple mnemonic that I like to use to remember the difference between all these different types of transport. All right, one last type of transport that I wanted to mention for today is osmosis. Now, osmosis, simply put, is the diffusion of water. So it's when water moves across the membrane from a high concentration to a low concentration and often occurs when there are differences in concentrations of solute, so substances dissolved in solution that can't cross the membrane, but water can. And in general, water will move towards where there is more solute, even though the water itself is going from a high water concentration to a lower water concentration. But let's look at a few examples. If we have a cell and the concentration of particles in and out of the cell is relatively the same, that's called an isotonic solution, equal on both sides. And so we're going to have a net water move. Water is still going to move in and out, but it will do so at about at approximately an equal rate. And so we won't have any net gain of water or net loss of water out of the cell. Now, if we have a situation where there is actually a higher concentration of solute of particles inside the cell and a lower concentration of solute outside the cell, what's going to happen is we, we have a hypotonic environment. Think hypo meaning low, so low solute. And if we think of the term solute sucks, we can remember that water is going to move towards where there's a higher solute concentration. But think also about where there's a higher water concentration. Remember, water itself will move from where there's high water concentration to a lower water concentration. So there's a higher water concentration, apparently, on the outside, a lower water concentration comparatively on the inside, so water will move into the cell. Often this may cause a cell to expand or even burst, but that depends on the situation. Situation. Now in this environment, we have a higher concentration of particles outside the cell, lower concentration of particles inside the cell. This is called a hypertonic environment. Think hyper, like excited, like there's a lot. So there's more particles outside the cell. And again, water will move from a higher concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. So in this case, it will move out of the cell. The cell may even shrink. So let's do a little bit of practice together. A cell is in a beaker with a solution with a higher salt concentration outside than inside the cell. What will happen to the cell? Think about it. Water's gonna move out. Remember, solute sucks. Water will move towards the lower concentration of water and out of the cell, and the cell may even shrink. A cell is in a beaker with a solution with a lower concentration outside than inside. What will happen to the cell? Well, pretty much the opposite. Water is going to move in, the cell may swell or even burst. Okay, now let's put some numbers to it. A cell is in a beaker with a solution with an 85% salt concentration on the outside and a 15% salt concentration on the inside. Salt cannot cross the membrane. What will happen to the cell? Now think about it in terms of numbers. So we have 85% salt on the outside, 15% salt on the inside. If you're doing this on your own with no diagram, you could even draw it out if you had a problem like this. And then on the outside, there's 15% water, 85% water on the inside. So where is the water concentration highest? It's on the inside of the cell. Water will move from high to low. So water will move outside of the cell. What could happen to the cell? It could shrink. All right, finally, our last one. A cell is in a beaker with a solution with a 25% salt concentration outside and an 80% salt concentration inside the cell. What will happen to the cell? Think about it. Water will move in and the cell could swell or even burst. All right, thanks so much for sticking with us. We're gonna continue on our 30 day study challenge tomorrow, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. We're going over one of my favorite topics, which is enzymes. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.